So I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the night is Joanne, Fa Joanne Farnan. Um, I'm not going to mess up her bio because I got it right in front of me. Um, so Joanne has uh, private, private sector experience. Uh, she was a controller for Alcatel um, and also has various public sector uh, experience in the Ottawa Carleton Catholic School Board and also for uh, Canada Post. Uh, for Canada Post, uh, she was the director of strategy where she implemented uh, long-term strategy development, including a $2 billion postal transformation. Uh, she's been a manager of financial services at the City of Ottawa, where she was the financial lead uh, of city projects, including the affordability of light rail transit, uh, the transportation master plan, the development charge background study, the Plasco Agreement, the double-decker buses, and the new flyer business cases. Uh, she's currently the manager of financial strategy, and she has over four and a half years of municipal experience. Please welcome Joanne Farnan. I feel like a rock star here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's quite something to see this size of a crowd here tonight, so uh, that's, that's great. So in case anyone didn't he read any of the posters that were posted all over the building, uh, our Ottawa light rail project was the subject of a Harvard Business School case, which is pretty exciting in a sense. Um, just an overview, but what I'd like to try to accomplish tonight is a bit of a, a background, uh, again, about the project. Not too much in detail, because I think a lot of you have heard you know, much. It's, uh, uh, in the news uh, all the time in the city. Um, a little bit about, though, the P3 procurement process and, and because essentially what this case is centered on is the concept of value for money, which is central to assessing a P3. Um, and I think what the Harvard Business School wanted to accomplish by this business case was to, to determine what learning opportunities there were um, like to also address then how closely did this actually mirror our own process because again a business case is part fact part fiction um, and also why is this significant to municipalities in the future in this age of p3 procurement and i have to say uh, that both mark uh, and will demonstrate it again how all of these pieces come together in terms of the complexity now of procurement the risks involved the debt uh, you know, required in the financing challenges municipalities face now to get uh, these infrastructure projects in place. So it kind of was a good introduction even beforehand. So. so just a, a, again, again, a bit of context in terms of Harvard Business School, I'm sure everyone has heard of, if not have done a case during their academic career. It, depending on what ranking uh, you look at, it's consistently rated the number one, if not one of the top business schools in the entire world. They were the, the uh, folks who pioneered the use of business case as a learning tool. They actually sell 80% of all the business cases globally uh, that, are, that are produced each year. And of that, they produce 350 cases a year. Um, and as I said, we were profiled in this February in one of their business cases. And essentially they were asking the whole crux of the case, if you read it all through, is they wanted the students to evaluate our winning bid, uh, the value for money with regards to that project. Um, and why would that be then? Why did that catch their attention? You know, they only, 33% of their cases are global cases when they produce every year and we were singled out, so that's quite uh, a compliment, I would say. We actually, um, our project again was a $2 billion project in terms of construction when you consider we bundled in the 417 widening. So 1.8 billion for our own project plus another 200 million for that 417 bundling. And we have a maintenance, 30 year maintenance contract that's worth $2.2 billion uh, in total payments that actually at a net present value is about a billion dollars at 2018. The project has won numerous awards, uh, which likely is what caught also um, Harvard Business School's attention. We've received the Canadian Council of uh, Public-Private Partnerships Gold 
Award for Pro Transportation Innovation, uh, the P3 Deal of the Year per Project Finance Magazine, uh, and we just won a silver award for America's Best Rail Transit Project. So all of that's you know quite prestigious in, in terms of that and showing that we're actually uh, very progressive in how we're accomplishing things here at the city. Uh, and just to put in context, I mean, Canada has awarded over the past number of years about $63 billion uh, in uh, P3 contracts. And that's a little over 200 uh, projects. So this is becoming an increasingly um, strong vehicle for municipal all levels of government to actually uh, put in place as a procurement methodology. So to take a look back in terms of why would we even, the, the case starts off where it's at the point where we've got the winning bid that's RTG and asking us, asking the students to assess um, you know, whether there is value for money. Truth be told, in reality, you actually do this way, way, way before that in terms of as you're starting to consider your project and how you're going to procure it, that's when you really do a value for money, your first one, because you would proceed very differently under a traditional method of procurement than you would under a P3. Uh, so you make that assessment at that point in time because you would be asking a very different set of criteria when you would procure the project under a P3 project. So you have to consider it back at that point in time, why, why would you consider doing a P3? Well, one huge advantage is you, you buy yourself the assurance that the project is going to be delivered on time and on budget at a fixed cost, and that was very pertinent to us with regards to this project. There's a lot of checks and balances in contracting during during construction, the milestone payments could be withheld, and those can be very significant in terms of value um, if either they miss a, a delivery date or if the, perform, if the specifications aren't being met, which would add direct cost to RTG in terms of financing. They're on the hook because they've incurred these costs and they'd still be waiting for us to pay them. Um, the lenders also that are involved in the project then, they monitor the situation and they actually can step in and remediate. Um, and so it's essentially a big stick that we have that uh, helps with regards to, again, ensuring that the project works uh, as it should. The other thing also is that scope changes are minimized. Just given the complexity of these contracts, um, you know, the, the scope that's so clearly defined, all of those things, that it really does minimize the amount of, of uh, uh, options that, you know, counselors have to actually say, let's change this and that, because we actually have a very firm contract, very difficult to do. And when we start making changes and people second-guessing themselves, that often lends itself to a lot of added costs in, in construction. Um, there's also usually, there can be a concession period, which ensures then that we have a long, long-term life cycle focus um, with regards to the quality of the construction and also the service and maintenance options. Um, it also offer, often, often offers innovation with regards to, because you're actually thinking of what the end goal is, more in terms of performance specifications and that what you actually want to accomplish. In our case, we wanted to actually be able to ensure our system could deliver 24,000 riders eventually per day. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes on with all of the parties in, bef in before the bids are actually even delivered in terms of giving them opportunities to discuss what that end product should look like and an opportunity for them to pitch certain innovations. Um, the other thing now that's just added this, this year is that now both Canada and Ontario require all municipalities, if they want to actually secure any funding for projects that are over $100 million, have to consider whether a P3 should be delivered uh, as a method of pr procurement. Uh, now, within that, there are several options. You can build finance, you can design build finance, you can design build finance maintain, or you can design build finance operate and maintain. So I, I, I sort of put the F is the common factor here, so that's why it's in red. So there's always a financing component with regards to this. Again, because you want that big stick. 
So why specifically a DBFM? Well, for a lot of those same reasons in terms of it delivers savings in the overall planning, design, project management and construction, and risk transfer. And for us, risk transfer was key. Uh, as you might have heard, we were able to secure actually complete risk transfer with regards to geotech. Uh, and that was particularly important given that we were constructing a tunnel where sometimes you never know what you're going to hit, as we've already witnessed in terms of the Waller Street collapse, and there's been a couple of other less um, significant uh, incidents, but those types of things that if you were under a traditional approach, those would be costs that, that your contractor would come back and say, you know, this is your responsibility, you know, here's another X million dollars to add to your cost. Um, private financing, though, does add added costs and some time because it does it is more complex, it takes more time to put in place. But overall, though, we still think it's an effective tool to ensure that uh, all the, the benefits uh, are derived. Uh, again, as I said, external lenders provide oversight during the construction and maintenance term. And uh, again, because they, and even over, sorry, under the construction and maintenance term, because again, they, we actually can withhold payment both during construction and then over that 30 year period where we're paying, repaying them uh, for their financing. That so key, uh, some of the key facts then with regards to the the, the Confederation line itself, and the premise already is in there in the business case. Um, so what you, they don't talk about is how we made some of those decisions. Um, we actually required, there was a financing package of $300 million, so we will be repaying RTG for a 30-year period after the opening of the line in 2018. Um, so that, again, uh, this is getting rather repetitive, but that, again, gives us that stick. Um, so, basically, 2P3 or not 2P3, and how do you assess that? Well, that comes back to the whole value for money exercise. And what does the value for money exercise actually try to accomplish? It tries to actually do a like-to-like -like comparison of, if you were to do a construct under the, the regular methods that you would design, you would put a contract out for procurement, in terms of saying, here, give me a fixed cost to construct this, um, um, versus under a P3 situation where there is financing involved, a concession period involved, um, a very complex contract in that. And usually, uh, most often cases, a design component that's in that so that all of the considerations are made from start to, to finish. Um, so financial models are prepared for both uh, and then they're adjusted for risk. And I'll try to demonstrate then where that is, and that's what, the again, the crux of this whole case was. Um, so ultimately then you wanna actually do that comparison, and we actually then treat it though, because these contracts are very long, on a present value basis, so that you can actually, uh, if benefits are further out, you know, you actually consider the time value of money. Um, so, for instance, uh, I just read a report that suggested that, again, uh, there's about 120 mil 20 projects that were delivered over the last 10 years as P3s in Canada, and they uh, estimate that there is a $10 billion value for money uh, was extracted from that. So that's meaning that that is, you know, purely what the hypothetical savings are from delivering these as a P3 model. Uh, rather than through the traditional methods. So to illustrate in terms of then a VFM, what you actually would do, so you see a few things here, and this is ultimately the whole exercise that we have gone through. We did this uh, for the Confederation line. We're doing it currently for the combined sewage storage tunnel. We'd be doing this on a constant basis for any of our large projects, basically. Um, so what you see is a comparison, again, of a base cost, which ultimately would be the construction cost. You'll see under the P3 option, most often it's, it will always be higher because they will price in a bit in terms of the risks that they're taking on, uh, as well as they incur some short-term financing costs during the construction period because normally you're withholding some portion of payment during the construction period. 
Then uh, financing, and again, financing will always be higher under the P3 option because you're paying private sector rates for financing as opposed to as uh, public sector, we actually, with guaranteed revenue streams, we actually secure some pretty good uh, financing rates. So up to this point, you're saying, doesn't sound like this is necessarily uh, a good deal for the city. Why is that? Well, and, and sorry, actually, there's also some ancillary costs, which really means that there's a lot of legal and you need some advisors and consultants and all of those things to help you evaluate all of, all of this, uh, um, all of these contracts. So getting up to that point then, yes, there's, there's more costs incurred with regards to P3. Where it really starts to shift is with regards to that retained risks. What you're really doing is you're buying yourself insurance. So as I said, in terms of we would run the risk otherwise if we had run into some problems with the soil um, or any other project delays that would have actually then cost us more in terms of detours during all of that time, um, added cost and pricing because of, again, inflation, all of those things, that's where you, you start to minimize your costs because you're paying for it up front so you know what those things are and you're also gaining some innovation because they're coming up with some better ideas as they go along and they bring their expertise to the table with regards to that. Um, so, th so that's, and then they've added something here and I, I don't, I kind of disagree with regards to this. They, they call this a competitive neutrality. Um, and it, what they're actually suggesting is that to actually do a like-to-like -like comparison, you should take into account the fact that the, that there would be uh, essentially taxes paid with regards to all of those contracts under the public sector model. I th I, to me, that's a bit questionable in terms of doing a like-to-like -like comparison. Um, but they, they have included it in their evaluation. Um, both the consultant and I looked at this and we kind of disagreed somewhat with, with regards to that, but uh, it is in some cases is considered as part of the comparison then. So, if you look through the business case, in the end, this is really, it boils down to this is what they're suggesting. They want a student to take a look at and actually uh, compare, again, under the two situations, what would you be better off doing? So, and where it's a little complicated, where it, why there's so many columns here is basically, again, because you are doing this at two different times. So the public sector comparator there was done before we even got the contract in place, the bids in and that, you make it your, your sort of your best estimates and some the consultants and the financial advisors will help you do this is they make certain assumptions with regards to um, what a premium that the, that bidder might put in and all those types of things. So you do it at that point in time to say, okay, yes, the added benefits outweigh the costs, but you'll do that again when you actually get your bid in, and what they call then a shadow bid at that point in time, and that's what they really want you to uh, to look at at that. So the green cells, so the cells that actually have numbers are in white were actually givens that they gave us, and again, some of those things are based on a lot of them are based on our actual documents that went to council that and this public information that was provided. Some other things, they've, uh, they've actually made certain assumptions in terms of especially with regards to what those risks were for the construction and the cost overrun because we didn't disclose that type of information specifically publicly. Uh, so they took some license with regards to that. The interesting thing is when we, uh, we actually reviewed the business case and, and Mona Monkman, our deputy treasurer at the time, um, was quite concerned because uh, we looked at it and said, they've made some mistakes here. <laughs> and uh, she was quite afraid we might have a bit of egg on her face if someone looked and, and ran through the numbers and it turned out there wasn't value for money and what was the city of Ottawa doing? Um, as it turns out, so we, we actually re-engaged our consultants and you know I worked through it with them and we determined basically because they made a mistake in terms of what they, that $292 million of proposed financing costs, I don't know if you read that, I would read that as interest costs. We're not paying $292 million of interest with regards to the financing specifically on this project. That's the actual loan to RTG, and they misstated a bit, it should be $300 million. Um, so, 
so that was a, a bit of a concern again that that's that's way higher than it should have been I'll, you'll see what the actual number is uh, behind uh, behind the close the door next to to this after the next slide I should say um, but because they actually had uh, pretty high risk assumptions in there as to what that is it more than offset so anyone having completed the case still would have come to the same conclusion as we did that there is value for money in the project albeit not exactly how we saw it as um, and how do you actually go through in reality some of these things particularly that risk assessment you conduct whole day work risk workshops where you actually go through and you actually determine and uh, Groups like Infrastructure Ontario have vast databases based on all of their years of working on these things in terms of what is the value of, of all of these risks. What's the value of the risk of that there's a strike happens during the construction period? What's the, what's the value, uh, again, like what percentage risk is that? What percentage risk is there that the soil conditions aren't what they, you expect them to be? Um, numerous, like it's pages and pages long that you can get into the details of these things. So you, you assess what the potential dollar value of those risks are to your project, and you also look then at what the probability of occurrence is with regards to that. Maybe it's a huge risk, but you know the, the, per, the chance that that would happen would be minuscule. So that's not weighted that high then. So you have to go through all of that exercise and you look at it both from both perspectives. You look at it in, in the context of if you delivered it in the normal manner and you'd have change orders, uh, you'd have delays, uh, any of those things, and then you look at it in the context of a P3 world where you know all the work that's happened to date. Uh, you know that that bidder now uh, has reviewed all of these things in detail. They're taking on the design, let's say, so you know that you don't have, they won't point the finger back to you to say it was your design, so that is not working out. You have to pay for any of the added costs if there's some some problems with that design. So you can take that off the table. So you make all of that assessment and do that whole like to like comparison. Um, and then the differential in the financing cost, that's really is when you look at it, is the differential between that higher private sector rate and your own rate over that term. So the completed uh, Harvard Business School case, we went through and we actually filled it out ourselves in terms of assessing uh, how that does, that did compare. And what we determined then in terms of that is that, and, and the key things again then are there's the knowns and then there's the unknowns that are estimated in terms of those things. So the project financing costs that are, is above the city of, uh, of Ottawa rates uh, over that length of term, we determined in present value terms that was a $96 million differential. And uh, the actual Harvard business case does quote that as being, um, about 100 million, so they were actually pretty close in, in, in determination of that, yet they, they messed it up on their table. I'm not quite sure uh, what happened there. Uh, that competitive neutrality adjustment where they actually assumed that you'd, they would have paid taxes on their margins that they gained from our maintenance contract, they came, the figure amounts to 23 million. Uh, the retained risk contingency is that because even then you, you cannot transfer 100% of risks, so you still have some risks uh, and you actually make a provision for that. So that's 65 million there that they, they put in in terms of that. Um, and then the risks in terms of that both, as I said before, you look at again what those potential risks are, uh, the value that those might cause you, and the chance that they will happen, uh, that amounted to basically in their terms over the construction time frame, a $292 million uh, risk when you think of that over a $1.8 billion contract. Yeah, that's in the realm of possibility, I suppose. A maintenance, again, 74 million, but again, that's on a $2.2 billion uh, you know, payment terms to them, a $74 million. So you're, what you're, you're doing is you're starting, maybe I should back up a second, you're comparing, this was the original estimate that we had come up with back in 2011. So you start with that and then you actually then are putting all of these uh, adjustments on it in order to compare to now the world of a P3. When you do that, we came up with, uh, if we had delivered this under our traditional means, it would have been a $2.5 billion uh, 
uh, cost ultimately to the city. As now, in terms of with our actual P3 bid, and those are the actual costs with our RTG contract, those came in essence then to roughly a little over $2.2 billion, which means about a $300 million. And again, this is theoretical. You never could prove this. You'd actually have to go out and construct another whole or actually procure another whole confederation line under a traditional method to actually prove this. But theoretically, we're saving $300 million. And we actually know we've, we've actually attained some of that because of some of those incidents we've already encountered, uh, which would then, in percentage terms, be about an 11 percent um, return on that uh, P3 basis as opposed to traditional. So. Maybe to wrap up, and I think I'm I'm a little bit over my time, so I apologize. Uh, it's it's a very complex uh, um, discussion with regards to P3s, and you still have some skeptics, and then you have other people embrace it. If you talk to Nancy Shepherds now, she would embrace the P3 world. Um, so, how do you assess whether a project is a good P3 candidate? Well, you would actually have to do that BFM at a very early stage. Even before that, they have a P3 screen that's a bit of a short questionnaire that considers what are the complexities of your project and that that gives you an indication as to whether or not there'd even be any interest in it as a P3. Typically, they should be over at least $60 million. Um, and again, they should be rather new construction. There's some hesitancy about uh, where there's any retrofits in that that um, bidders don't want to get involved in that because they can't assess all the risks with that existing structure. Um, then you would have to consider, and that's what we did do uh, as the next step, okay, we're going to do a P3, but which type of P3? And there's a whole exercise that goes into then assessing that. Um, and then you also have to, that 300 million, how did we come up with that figure? And again, that goes back to sort of an iterative process to say where does that, you need that stick, but to the extent you make it too high you're, and you're paying so much more in terms of private, sec private sector interest rates, you're going to actually cost yourself a lot more money that might outweigh the benefits from that risk transfer. So it's, it's, it's a bit of an exercise to actually strike that right balance. Um, so we're going to continue to see P3s for our larger projects. As a matter of fact, we're planning on that with our phase two for, for LRP. Definitely, we are fairly certain it will be, given the size of a, another $3 billion project, it will be a P3. Uh, and we'll have to actually do that uh, probably to secure federal and provincial funding. So it's with us here to stay. If uh, you get an opportunity in your career to get involved in it, it's a very interesting uh, way of, of looking at things. And uh, um, you know, given the complexity and everything involved, it certainly is a, a very rewarding exercise and allows us to accomplish, uh, you know, otherwise some things that we probably couldn't because we couldn't get all of that financing otherwise. So that wraps up. Thank you, Joy. Okay, thank you.